This week's episode is brought to you by Fairy Godmother Travel. Contact them for all of your Disney travel needs. And you can do that by emailing Communicore Weekly at FairyGodmotherTravel.com. Hello and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And the year is almost over. Are you excited, George? Do you have any New Year's resolutions? Um, yeah, but some of them I can't talk about. Oh, okay. I was going to say, this is like technically the last episode. Oh, it is the last episode before the New Year hits. It is the last episode before the year. Yeah. You know, you know. Um, uh, right, 17... Bestsellers, seventeen bestsellers. That's a lot of work for well, twelve months, dude. Yeah, I mean James Patterson does it. So, all right, that's that's fair. That's that's, that's pretty a fair. little bit different. No, no, I went to visit lots of theme parks and ride lots of roller coasters. I think that's, that's a good resolution to have, actually. I can do that. I, th- I, I think that. that's one's much more attainable than seventeen bestsellers. Maybe like I, twelve bestsellers is is a more reachable just one goal. a month. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess we could do that. I let's, guess we could do that. Let's try that. You know what one of my resolutions is? Mm-mm. I want to learn about Busch Gardens Tampa. Ooh. We might be able to handle that before the year's over. What? That's crazy talk. It's all crazy talk. That's what Communicore Weekly is. Crazy talk. It's time for the story. Back in episode 205, we discussed the very beginnings of Busch Gardens amusement parks with the original Busch Gardens that opened in Pasadena, California in 1906 on the Busch Estate. And, you know, the public were, was able to visit that Busch Gardens park in Pasadena until 1938. But we head over to the East Coast and visit the Tampa region to look at the history of Busch Gardens Tampa today. So Anheuser-Busch opened an admission-free beer garden and bird show on March 31st, 1959, on the grounds of their brewery in Tampa. And Busch Gardens Tampa, as it was called, offered beer tasting, a bird show, and animal acts, all in a tropical setting. Also offered was the Stairway to the Stars, a very long escalator that took you to the top of the brewery. And at the time, it was the longest continuous motor stairway ever built. It rose 86 feet to the observation deck of the $25 million brewery, and it was also the start of the brewery tour. So August A. Bush Jr., who was the president of the company from 1946 to 1975, opened the old Swiss Swiss house in 1964. It was a Valentine's present for Trudy, his third wife, which apparently he wasn't giving his first and second (laughs) wife's uh, houses. No. Um... The old Swiss house offered fine dining and a cafeteria for park guests. August built the old Swiss house to actually resemble the old Swiss house in uh, Lucerne, uh, Switzerland, that was owned by Trudy's brother. Uh, Now, the old Swiss house would overlook the Serengeti Plain, which obviously makes sense, uh, for many years. (laughs) But uh, speaking of the Serengeti Plain... Yes, in 1965, a 29-acre expansion that allowed the animals to roam freely, and it was created, and it was called the Serengeti Plain. This expansion allowed for a 70-acre habitat, and at the time considered to be the largest outside of the African continent. The Velt monorail was added in 1966, and Bush Gardens adopted the motto, where people are caged and the animals run free. (laughs) <laughs> yes, yeah, I chuckle. By 1968, three years before Walt Disney World would open, Busch Gardens was the most popular tourist attraction in the state, attracting three million visitors each year. Now, the Boma area, uh, now known as Nurabi, uh, opened on jo- uh, excuse me, July 31st, 1970. Uh, it was an you know it's an African small animal zoo uh, with a petting zoo where guests could feed and uh, pet uh, goats and baby camels. Um, there was also an indoor area where guests can view the nocturnal animal, animals. In 1971, the Transvelt Express opened, uh, it's actually now called the Serengeti Express, which was a two-mile railroad around the park. Uh, this offered another way for the guests to get up and personal with all the animals. 
And the competition from Walt Disney World's opening was felt, and Busch Gardens Tampa embarked on a very healthy program of expansion. Stanleyville, a new land, opened in June of 1973 and included the Stanley Falls Flume, which had a 43-foot drop. And of course, it was built by our good friends at Aerodynamics. Uh, the Skyride opened in May of 1974 and offered an impressive view of the Serengeti Plain, and it's still in operation today and rivals the train for the view of the animals. The Moroccan Village was added in 1975 and had craftsmen and performers. In 1976, the Congo area opened and it offered the monstrous uh, Mamba, which was a flat ride, and the Python. Uh, the Python was the park's first coast coaster and it featured a corkscrew and two inversions. It actually closed in 2006, but the cars uh, were actually shipped to Busch Gardens Williamsburg to be used for the Loch Ness Monster. Not the actual Loch Ness Monster, <laughs> but the roller coaster of the Loch Ness Monster. Well, the real Nessie might need roller coaster cars. Um, maybe, if she's offering rides. Maybe. Okay. So around the same time, the park changed its name to <clears throat> Busch Gardens The Dark Continent to obviously reflect the African theme because they've got a Swiss house. There. Yeah, their marketing department's not making too much sense here. Yeah, yeah. It's, you'll see there's some strange decisions that are made. So, Okay, so the African Queen Boat Ride opened in 1977 in the Stanleyville section and was similar to the Jungle Cruise, but with some live animals and not as many jokes from what I understood. And in 1989, this part would actually be converted into the <clears throat> Tanaika Tidal Wave, a shoot the shoots flume ride. Okay, so going back uh, to the 1970s, Congo also had the Swinging Vines, which was a wave swinger, the Congo River Rapids, which are still in operation, and the Ubanga Banga Bumper Cars, which might be the best name for any attraction That's actually pretty awesome. ever. Ubanga Banga. Uh, from here, the park history gets a little convoluted, and by a little, I mean a lot. And uh, there were several expansions and sometimes very conflicting information that I found. So sometimes there was a new name for a land, and sometimes rides were inherited by a new land, and we will try to keep it as clear as possible and as simple as we can. But you know we're going to fail miserably in that. So, That's our job. It is pretty much our job, yeah. In 1980, Timbuktu opened, which was an $18 million expansion. Uh, Scorpion, which is a Swarwarfer car steel <laughs> looper cope? I don't know. Whatever. Schwarzkopf. Yeah, that's it. What George that's said. It. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it opened and is still the park's oldest roller coaster. Uh, it also only has lap bars, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> um, Timbuktu also included the Caravan Carousel, the Phoenix, which is a swinging boat ride that goes upside down, the Monstrous Mamba, the uh, spinning flat ride, kind of like an octopus, the Crazy Camel, a flat ride, and the Sandstorm, which is an orbital flat ride. And Timbuktu was renamed Pantopia with the opening of Falcon's Fury in 2014. Yeah, it gets crazy. So, because <clears throat> remember, guys, we're talking about Bush Gardens, the Dark Continent. So, the Dwarf Village opened in 1983 <laughs> near the Bird Gardens. Um, this area was designed for children aged 3 to 12 and had statues of dwarfs, mushroom houses, and Leprechaun Lane. Because I'm sure there's one of those in Africa somewhere. Makes sense to me, guys. Yeah. There was also a canoe ride, a miniature car ride, a tube slide, a ball crawl, and a tunnel maze. Uh, there were also recreations of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Little Red Riding Hood, and Hansel and Gretel. And eventually, this area would be called the Sesame Safari of Fun. So at least that's closer. I to guess. An I don't know where the Safari Park comes in, but okay. Yeah. Um,. So also in the 1980s, uh, we would see the addition of the Morocco Palace Theater, a 1,200-seat theater that would house many Broadway-level shows over the years, including Kaleidoscope. And the 1990s would see a tremendous amount of growth, mainly due to the roller coaster wars of the time. Uh, Busch Gardens Tampa would see three roller coasters added during the decade, but there were also a lot of other openings uh, as well. Okay, so the old Swiss house closed in 1982 and would be used for auditions and rehearsals until... 1990 when it reopened as the Colony House, a full-service dining experience. And that makes more sense. Yeah, it's okay. The Colony House, you know, because um, you've got the English imperialism going on, or the British imperialism. So this area became known as the Crown, Col Co wow, the Crown Colony Plaza. And we're still looking for date on this, but we assume it was 1990. I, we couldn't find any confirmation. So 1991 also bought the Questor, 
to the Crown Colony Plaza. And this was a motion simulator ride that put you on the quest for diamonds. And it would be replaced by Akbar's Adventure Tours in 1998, which starred Martin Short in a wacky tour of Egypt. Not what I assume by the name. No, I think we all know what Akbar immediately comes to mind when exactly. you say Akbar. You know it. Anyway, so in 1989 also saw the opening of the Clydesdale Hamlet in the Crown Colony Plaza, where the famous Clydesdale lived. Um, in 1992, a three acre great ape habitat opened called um, Mombi Reserve. Uh, originally housed six western lowland gorillas and nine chimpanzees. Uh, 1993 would see the addition of a record breaking attraction for Bush Gardens Tampa as well. Yes, Kumba opened on April 20th, 1993, and it's a sit-down roller coaster built by Bollinger and Mabillard, my favorite coaster designers and manufacturers, and at the time, it featured the world's tallest vertical loop and was the fastest, tallest, and longest coaster in Florida. Um, sadly, it would lose the title of tallest vertical loop the following year, but I'm digressing because I do that. <laughs> so in 1995, the Land of the Dragons replaced the Dwarf Village. <laughs> <laughs> um, it would be replaced by the Sesame Street Safari of Fun in 2010, and all of the rides would just simply be rethemed. The mascot was Dumfrey the Dragon, and uh, they are included in a three-story treehouse. Uh, there was also a theater, slides, a rope climb, a flume ride, and a dragon carousel. And Land of the Dragons actually still exists in Busch Gardens, Williamsburg, not Tampa. Yes, Williamsburg. but in Williamsburg. So Egypt opened in 1996 with Montu. Another Bollinger and Mabillard coaster, this time it's an inverted coaster. And at the time, it was the world's tallest and fastest inverted coaster and would hold the record until Alpengeist opened a year later in Williamsburg. And Montu has seven inversions and is awesome. And you could also walk through a reproduction of King Tut's tomb, which included many replicas from the tomb, but I'm not sure if it had a replica of the curse or not. I would I hope know. not. I would hope not. So that closed in 2013 and would become the ride station for the future Cobra's Curse roller coaster in 2016. Yay. The Edge of Africa opened in 1997. And, it, you know, it's a walkthrough where guests can see crocodiles and lions and hyenas and hippos and lemurs and meerkats. Basically everything from The Lion King you can see there. <laughs> um, the original brewery clo closed in 1995, uh, which kind of sat in the Morocco section. And uh, Guanzi, a, a dueling wooden roller coaster built by the Great Coasters International, uh, opened on uh, June 18, 1999. Now, the cars were replaced in 2011 to offer a smoother ride, but Guanzi gave its last ride on February 1, 2015. No word on what will replace it or if the coaster will ever open again. Ah, got my fingers crossed. So the Serengeti Plain would see some upgrades in 2000, and Rhino Rally would open in 2001 in the Nairobi section. And this was a Vacoma River Adventure ride that was truly a one-of-a-kind experience. Guests would board modified Land Rovers and go on an off-road safari that included a section where the vehicle floated down the river on a piece of the collapsed bridge. Uh, sadly, the attraction closed in 2014. The Dolphin Theater began showing R.L. Stein's Haunted Lighthouse, a 40 attraction, in 2003. Uh, Cheetah Chase, a wild mouse coaster from Williamsburg, opened in February 2004. The Zambia Smokehouse began service in December 2004 in the Stanleyville section, and in 2005... Oh, oh wait, Jeff, let me, let me tell this one, let me tell all this right, one. All right, all right, all right. Yes, so on May 21st, 2005, Shikra opened to the world, and at the time, it was the world's longest, tallest, and fastest dive coaster um, until Griffin opened in Williamsburg a year later. Uh, still, Shikra is an incredible Bollinger and Mablarg coaster, of course. And in 2007, Shikra became a floorless dive coaster, which is even cooler. All right, yes. enough with your coaster talk. My turn. I know. All right. So the park reverted back to its original name of Busch Gardens Tampa for a few years, getting rid of the Dark Continent part, but then it was named Busch Gardens Africa. At yeah. least until 2008. I don't know. It's really, really confusing, guys. Yeah, it is. So, um, In 2006, Pirates 4D replaced R.L. Stein's Haunted Lighthouse, which reminds me, did you guys, any of you guys out there remember the R.L. Stein show at uh, Disney's MGM Studios? That was pretty awesome. Yeah, if you do, call us on the goat line. We'd love to hear your story. So, Heck yes. Um, in 2006, several areas of the Congo uh, were closed for renovation. Sadly, Python, the f park's first coaster, was demolished and Claw Island closed. In 2008, 
Jungala opens from the renovated areas of the Congo and features up-close exhibits for the orangutans and Bengal tigers. And there are also three new kitty rides in the area and an utterly incredible play area for the kids. It's very, very cool. So as we mentioned in episode 205, uh, Anheuser-Busch was purchased by InBev Corporation in 2008. And all the SeaWorld parks, including the Busch Garden Parks, were sold to the Blackstone Group in 2009 for $2.7 billion. Free beer samples were discontinued in 2009 because really that was probably where the bulk of all their lost money was going. (laughs) They just gave beer samples everywhere. (laughs) Um, The Sesame Street Safari Fun Area uh, replaced Atlanta the Dragons in 2010, and the existing rides were rethemed for the Sesame Street changes. The Clydesdale Hamlet was removed in 2009, and the Clydesdale Horses were removed in 2010. That's so sad. So in 2011... Cheetah Run opened, which was a viewing area for the park's cheetahs. And I realize that's an odd thing to say, but I guess the cheetahs do get to watch us occasionally. Yeah, that's true. Maybe there is a human viewing area for them. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and this Cheetah Run also offered an opportunity to speak with the animal handlers and trainers, as well as see special demonstrations of the cheetah's speed. And on May 27th, 2011, Cheetah Hunt opened, which was a multi launch coaster, you know, launch like rock and roller coaster and California screaming. Um, The queue was in the old monorail station, and the track traveled through parts of the Serengeti Plain. And it's a really great coaster that makes you feel as if you are the cheetah on the hunt. And isn't it true if you actually catch a gazelle when you're on the ride, you get to take it home with you? You get to take it home with you. Perfect. What a great souvenir, guys. you can only use your teeth to catch it. Hey, that's fine. That's fine. That works. That works. In January 2012, uh, it brought the Animal Care Center in Narambi. Uh, the facility gives guests the opportunity to see animal care, checkups, and x-rays up close and personal. And part of the facility is used for the Emmy-nominated television series, The Wildlife Docs. And, you know, we'd be remiss to forget to mention Adventure Island, a 30-acre water park that opened next door in 1980. It hasn't gone through many changes over the years, but it's still there, and you can still get wet. <laughs> We hope so. All right, so the the history of Busch Gardens Tampa is is fairly unique for theme parks as far as its growth and evolution have been over the years. And it's been a park that put its uh, animals first and offered world-class exhibits. You know, I got to visit the park a few weeks ago, and I was amazed at how Disney's Animal Kingdom actually copied a lot of the Busch Gardens Tampa experience. Um, I really enjoyed the animal encounter so much more than I expected, especially being able to pet a baby flamingo. It was so cute. (laughs) And I got to touch kangaroos and feed them gigantic pieces of, like, tree leaves or something like that. Interesting. Not something I picked, but they handed it to me. So, oh, okay. You know, if you have a chance to visit Bush Gardens Tampa on your next trip, I really highly recommend it. It's about an hour and ten minutes away from Orlando, so it's not bad. But we would also like to know what you think about Bush Gardens Tampa, or if you got to visit it sometime in its first decade or two. Give us a call on the Communicore Weekly Goat Line at 424-785-4628. 424-785-4628. He's a nerd, he's a geek, he's a geek, but we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ha! It's George's Book of the Week. A Whole New World, A Twisted Tale by Liz Braswell. And this is a new series for Disney um, that takes a well-loved animation film or animated film and turns it on its ear. In this case, Braswell gets to imagine what would have happened if Jafar from Aladdin had gotten his hands on the magic lamp and, you know, instead of Aladdin. I wasn't sure what to expect, but I really look forward to hearing about or reading the book <laughs> after hearing Jeff talk about it. Yeah. yeah, we we got an advanced copy. And for whatever reason, I just read it first before George did. And like the basically just the concept alone, I was completely enthralled with, you know, anything that deals with alternate views of history or, you know, in this case, a fictional narrative that we know quite well. It always fascinated me. And being as how Aladdin is one of my top animated films, if not the top animated film, Mm -hmm. I was just kind of curious to see how the whole thing would shake out. Yeah, and and this is a book that's obviously, it's geared towards teens and young adults, especially because it does stray heavily from the film. Uh, The characters are all there, and they all have the same motivations that we see in the film, but different things happen along the way. And we really do get to see everyone in a different light, including the genie. Um, the magic carpet is there. He plays a little bit different. Iago is there for a little while. And Abu, because it's fun to say Abu. Um, magic also plays a vastly different role in this book. And that's where some of the darker parts come in. 
Yeah, I mean, well, I just I, scared myself. Sorry. You probably did because yeah. I got to be honest. I was pleasantly surprised at how <laughs> dark the book got at times, yeah. like beyond what I would have expected. <laughs> I had to double check to see what I was reading, what the suggested reading age was, because it just got really, really dark and mm-hmm. borderline morbid at uh, parts. You know. Yeah. That said, I personally I wasn't upset at any of these changes. I yes, again, it's an alternate look at this tale. Um, yeah. And I really liked how the story played out and how differently, you know, George said their motivations were the same, yes, but they're all different from what we're used to. Like, seeing what they were in the film compared to what they are in this book was amazing to me. Yeah, and this is one of those books that we really can't tell you much about it. You know, spoiler, sweetie. Besides, you know, setting up the basic idea that Jafar actually gets the lamp, everything else is and should be a surprise for the reader. That being said... Braswell did a great job of keeping the feel of Agrabah, the street rats, and all of the characters. Uh, The point in which the story diverges doesn't change the characters, except it does magnify their personalities. And there there are also a few times when the main character is about to step over the line, so to speak. And it's very compelling to see how the story is shaped and, and how it moves. And, you know, speaking of the point where the entire story changes, you know, that was intriguing to me. I was... I don't want to say bored. I was getting <laughs> to the point of being bored uh, of the opening bit because it was almost like a beat by beat uh, the same as the film. There were some added things, you know, introducing a couple of new characters and new, you know, side stories and whatnot. But, you know, Braswell does a good job of keeping the familiar familiar and then completely turning everything around on its head. Um, yeah. You know, like George said, the characters are still the people you watch a million times in the movies, but seeing their reaction to these new situations and, you know, these new things, it never really seems out of place for who and what they are and what we know of them. Yeah, when you mentioned reading, it, you're right, it was beat for beat, and it just hit me when Jafar gets the lamp, because that's the premise of the story, it's not really ruining anything. I kept reading for a few pages, and I went back and said, wait a minute, that didn't happen in the movie. So, <laughs> I was just going along with the story. Wait, this isn't a movie novelization. <laughs> wait a minute, hold on. So, you know, fans of Aladdin, and as Jeff mentioned, fans of alternate history, so to speak, are really going to enjoy the book. It did start off slow, but as the characters and the situations were introduced, the book picked up quickly. And there were some moments with different characters that really weren't expected, and a few that were rather sad. And those moments, though, still added to the rich tapestry of the narrative. And even though the book is for the teen market, I think adults are really going to enjoy the story as well. Obviously. I mean, I loved it. So, (laughs) Um, yeah, I mean, I I definitely recommend the book. And I really feel like the whole new world, no pun intended, that Braswell created will, you know, stand up to the original as well. And I definitely think you should give it a shot. And I definitely think that Disney should give Braswell a shot of kind of, you know, looking at different takes on other uh, other uh, animated films as well, because I think it was fantastic. I want to see more. Yeah, and I know they are doing more, which is good. So Heck yes. This week's book was A Whole New World, A Twisted Tale by Liz Braswell. Here's another minute that you can't get back. It's the 60 Second Review. So apparently there was some gigantic movie opening over the past week or two, depending on when you're listening to this. Of course, we are talking about Star Wars. Alvin and the Chipmunks. Oh, yeah, Star Wars, Alvin and the Chipmunks. That's it. Oh, wrong movie, sorry. (laughs) But we're talking about The Force Awakens, Episode 7 of our beloved trilogy of films, which is now a quadrilly. Nice work, George. I see what you did there. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, J.J. Abrams was given the helm, and Disney threw money at him, and... Everything was involved, and you know what? I've been a huge fan since I was six years old. I saw it in the theaters, A New Hope, and I love the film. I loved it. I 100% agree. I mean, I haven't. <laughs> I mean, we uh, we have discussed this before. I have not always been the biggest Star Wars fan. I have a lot of problems with original. I, I have problems with George Lucas, basically. But mm-hmm. the, from the second I saw the trailer for this film, I was like, I'm in. This looks really good. And then. Yeah. You know, we went on a last-minute decision on that Thursday night that it opened, and it was probably one of the best decisions of my life, because if somebody ruined it for me, I would have murdered them. Um, Yeah, I can see that. And that's why there are no spoilers, so you can keep listening. Yeah, no spoilers in this whatsoever. We're not going to spoil anything. Yeah, I saw it Thursday evening uh, with my brother, who is one of the two of the Communicore Weekly Orchestra. He's a Star Wars fan, but not like me. And he loved it. He raved about it as we walked out, and I was very pensive. Which you is know, funny, because he actually texted me when he got home, yeah. and he said, I loved it. George was very meh. Yeah, yeah, and it was like, I was pensive, but I just, I, I wanted to be grabbed like I was with A New Hope, but I was six at the time. 
So, uh, but, but I did go see it a second time with my family. Two days later, I had time to think about it. We got to talk about it on the car ride home and everybody loved it. And the theater was full. There were people dressed in costumes. It's great to have Star Wars back. So if you're on the fence about it, I think you should. I definitely think so, it. too. I don't think at I've ever been in a times. theater like this before where everyone was, like, cheering and yelling at, like, the right parts and, like, yeah. crying at the right parts. Yeah. Um, now, when I saw episode one at a midnight showing, everybody cheered when the fanfare started. Uh -huh. At the beginning, there was no cheering the rest of the movie. They, they, was it was just silent when everybody left yes. after that? There were multiple times in this film where people cheered gasped, yelled, and it was perfect. I, I agree. I mean, again, the film, I don't think, is perfect. That, and it doesn't need to be, I think. No. But yeah. for what it was going for, I think they nailed it. When we walked into the movie, Alex looked at me and said, I'm going to cry at some point. Please don't make fun of me. And <laughs> you know what? The fact that I got to see a new Star Wars movie in the theater with my son was great. But the fact yeah. that we both cried about, like babies are like two separate parts, like in the very beginning when it first started and then later yeah. on, which if you've seen it, you know why, um, is just amazing to me. It hit all the emotion emotional cues and I, I really liked it. And if you if you didn't like it, that's fine too. You're yeah. allowed to not like it. Uh, we're yeah. okay with that. You know, and basically a really good friend of mine who's not a big Star Wars fan, Wanted to go see it because of the hype. He loves movies. Um, came, we talked about this week, and he was like, that's what I want in a movie. I want the explosions. I want the, you know, action scenes. I want the story. I want your heartstrings pulled. Yeah. And this movie had all of it in spades. And I'm glad they finally cleared up the fact that R2-D2 was BB-8's mom. <laughs> With a Roomba. With a Roomba. DJ Roomba. Roomba from Parks and Rec. Oh, I love DJ Roomba. I want one of those for Christmas. <laughs> so we're saying thumbs up, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, lightsabers up. Two, Light, lightsabers, two up. lightsabers up. Sometimes you might see it. Sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. Since George was talking about Bush Gardens Tampa and, you know, how Animal Kingdom <laughs> supposedly stole stuff from it, blah, 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 <laughs> I just thought we would look at a five legged goat in the Animal Kingdom, uh, specifically in the Tusker House. Uh, so if, you, you know, when you go there, you'll kind of notice that it's supposed to be a working, living, breathing hotel. And toward the back of the restaurant, there's a door that's leading to parts unknown because you can't go through it. If you go through it, your name is probably Leonard Kinsey. Um, if you stand near the door and you listen, you hear a bunch of murmuring voices of hotel guests and uh, pots and pans banging around and a radio that's softly playing in the background. And every so often, you'll hear a knocking because the landlady is coming to collect the rent and she'll tell you that you're past due. And all these little touches just really help sell the illusion that the Tusker House is an actual place in the African section of the park. That's a very cool little detail. It's I love pretty neat. Do stuff I, like I that. Like yeah. And uh, up next, though, is no illusion... <clears throat> I, 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 I don't even know how to how to deal with that segue. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know you have to go to a, a, a reverse Arrested Development joke. Yeah, it's so it's not magic, a magic Michael. Trick? Yeah, something like that. So okay, we are talking again about our year of a million or so limited time cadets. So great. And we got the announcement for this week's prize winner. But before we get to that, we want to remind everybody there's still two one, one. episode left. One there's this. one episode left of this season, George. <laughs> But there's still time to win. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. Yeah, so just email communicorweekly at gmail.com with your name, address, and birthday so we can add you to the prize list. So this year's, this week's prize, and this year of a million or so limited time, that's the prize package is provided by the wonderful Fairy Godmother Travel. It goes to Jim K., from Wareham, Massachusetts. Hooray, Jim K. Congratulations, Jim K. And please let us know when you get that prize pack and send us a photo. We shouldn't just say a photo because you can just randomly send us a photo. That's true. I mean, you can randomly send okay. us a photo. Yeah, that would be okay. It's kind of up our alley. Like yeah, it's sort of what we deal with. But we, you know, we'd love to see it on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Tumblr or Pinterest or Tinder, Grindr. I mean, whatever you want to put yeah. it on. We whatever we'll social see media it. that you're on, we'll swipe left. Yeah. So. Um, well, no, you swipe got... right. Oh, we swipe right? Swipe left is when you don't like it. Oh, okay, so, okay. So we hope you don't swipe left. Math, you can't social episode. media. What is wrong with this guy, guys? I have no idea. So, okay. Well, uh, speaking of what's wrong with me, thank you guys so much for watching <laughs> and listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. <laughs> However you listen to the show, uh, you know, leave us a comment on iTunes or uh, rate us on iTunes. Leave us a, a, a comment on YouTube, whatever. We want to hear from you. Yes, you do. And uh, email us at communicorweekly at gmail.com simply to say hi, send us a random photo, 
or Supcory. You can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Weekly. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Imagine Erding, and he's at Jeff Heimbuck. And of course, you can always give us a call on the Communicore Weekly Goat Line at 424-785-4628. And make sure you visit communicoreweekly.spreadshirt.com to pick out some incredible shirts. Like, we should have a, the Nerd Awakens. We probably should design that shirt. Yeah, and it'd be like me and you, I could be dressed as BB-8. That'd be hilarious. And you could be... Would you be Finn? I guess. No, you have to be Rilo. I would just have the, the helmet on. You just wouldn't be able to see my face. You just wouldn't be able to see. Okay, yeah. well, we can we can do that. So, um, so yeah, buy a t-shirt. <laughs> that was a very long, convoluted way to get there, but thanks. <laughs> um, you can still get your official cadet membership card or Communicore Weekly stickers by sending a self-addressed stamped envelope to Communicore Weekly, P.L. Box 432, Orange, California, 92856. And you can always visit patreon.com slash Weekly and help support the greatest online show. For Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening, guys and gals. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. Joe Brumpy.